to know that you're doing the right thing for yourself. And that goes back to everything that we talked about. Are you being honest with yourself? Is this really going to be good for you? Is this really something that you want? Um, you know, is it is it the right time for it right now? You have to be willing to be honest with yourself and then say to yourself, okay, the only reason this isn't happening is because I'm afraid. Now, the next question for your intuition is, well, what do I need to do to get ready? What do I need to do to eliminate that fear so that I can wrap my arms around it and own it? That's what breaks the pattern. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shifting Dimensions. I'm your host, Jimmy Moses, and thank you so much for tuning in. I have the pleasure of speaking today with Susan Zumo. She is an intuitive and certified master teacher of higher consciousness and also the author of Mapping the Inner Landscape, Decoding the Symbols of Dreams and Everyday Life. Susan, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. It's just a treat to be here. Yes. Uh, like there's so much we have to cover. I want to start off with what does it mean to be a master teacher of higher consciousness? I was very fascinated by that title and wanted to learn more about that. Well, that's a good question. And I will say this, it's not a title that I gave myself. So um, after teaching an accelerated intuition course, which connected people to their soul via the intuition in three days, after I did that for um, 20, 20 years, my teacher uh, elevated myself and two other people to be able to make teachers who could teach the class as well. And at that time, she gave us the title of Master Teacher of Higher Consciousness. So um, I was really uncomfortable with it. <laughs> and, you know, when I see someone who puts master in front of their name, um, I really hesitated. And she said, she said, honey, you earned it. You've been doing it. You've done the work. You're doing the work. You've earned it. Put the title in front of your, your name. And I said, okay, I will. Um, it just means that, that I have mastered certain things with respect to intuition and healing. I'd like to believe that I've mastered a lot of myself, um, but that's an ongoing process, as you know. Yes, that's definitely a lifelong journey. Um, so, you know, we hear the word consciousness a lot and tapping into our higher consciousness or higher self. How would you define higher consciousness? It seems like it's linked to intuition. So consciousness is frequency. Everything is frequency. And whatever or wherever your frequency is, that's where your consciousness is. So when we talk about higher consciousness, what we're really talking about is shifting your frequency from a lower frequency to a higher frequency. So a teacher of higher consciousness is a person who guides others either through energetic initiations and or techniques on how to ele elevate their own frequency so that they can raise their consciousness. Yes, thank you for um, breaking that down. So just to, again, really make sure people understand. So when we talk about lower frequency versus higher frequency, intuitively, higher frequency to me tend to tends to align to things that relate to love, right? Self-esteem, um, care for others, compassion. Um, that's what I would consider higher frequency, just in layman terms, and then lower frequency would be like maybe giving into fear and anger um, and hate. So just, yeah. is that good? Is that a good understanding? That's exactly right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because fear, anything that has to do with fear, anger, um, those things are going to lower your frequency. And so they're going to lower your consciousness. Mm, right? Okay. And you do the work to help people elevate and rise to the higher frequency, higher vibrations, um, again, with love, acceptance, all of that stuff. Okay, got it. So, all right. So now that we have a good understanding of, of what drives you and, and what you really do in your work, I want to talk a little bit more about your story, right? Because I don't know if you, you know, were born with this 
instilled in you? Like, you're like, yes, I'm going to be a higher consciousness teacher. <laughs> I'm sure that probably wasn't the case. So I, I want to know what your journey was and how did you end up getting to a place where you were doing this work full time? You know, my journey is, is not very spectacular. Um, I would say that I was born with an intense interest of all things metaphysical. So I grew up in the 60s and 70s. So I was interested in ghosts and ghost stories and photographing apparitions. Um, I bought a book on palmistry when I was 12 years old and taught myself palmistry. And then I graduated to tarot. And it was just a curiosity. Um, I started doing self-hypnosis and, and just exploring everything I could. But I always considered myself a very sensitive but normal person. My career goal in life was to be a school teacher. It was not to be a metaphysical teacher. I thought I was going to teach seventh grade math for the rest of my life, right? So as I, I started to get further into my, my learning, my studies, I had the best dream life that anybody could ever want. And I really enjoyed dream interpretation. And I felt that it was a connection for me to my soul, even though I didn't have that word at the time, right? So I, I followed that path. And then in 1982, I met a woman named Connie Newton. And I learned from her that I could connect to my soul and activate my intuition immediately without years of study. So I ran to her class and took her class. And the day after I took her class, I started doing readings for other people. That was what I wanted to do. I'd had some done for myself and I knew how they made me feel and I knew what kind of benefit they were. And I wanted to do that for others. So in the middle of raising my kids, being a single mom, um, I taught Reiki, I did readings, I did uh, hypnotherapy because I had decided that I wanted to follow a spiritual path as a, a single mother. So I, I just kept taking classes and I just kept expanding and I did my own homework on myself. I worked on releasing my fears and dealing with my emotions, dealing with the, the breakup of the marriages, um, a lot of self-healing led to a lot of spiritual awareness. And so in the year 2000, um, my teacher Connie made available an opportunity for us to teach a version of the class that she had taught us. And I immediately knew that was it. I'm like, that's it for me. So I applied, um, I was initiated and I taught that class for 22 years along with the other things that I did. And so I still work, I still work in the corporate world. You know, I've raised kids. Um, I always laugh. I would say, you know, I would, I would go out and teach a class for a weekend and everyone was like, oh my God, you're so amazing. And I'd come home and my daughter would look at me and she'd say, you've been out all day. We're starving. When are you making dinner? So it was very grounding, right? I went from exalted teacher to terrible mom. Um, and that's kind of been the story of my life. I, I'm, I'm, I didn't know that you still worked in corporate. That's so interesting how you have this side of you that is deep into your intuition and you're working with people to elevate their higher consciousness. But at the same time, you're still working in corporate. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. So I want to double down on the intuition piece because I love talking about intuition. And, you know, you also say that you're a direct access intuitive. I want to know exactly what that means, because I always thought that intuition was a muscle that you kind of have to build, like to kind of un like to be able to hear your intuition and know when your intuition is speaking to you. But it seems like there's a way for us to kind of activate it much faster. So again, just want to know what it means to be a direct access intuitive and what exactly is intuition and where it comes from. Well, I'm going to take your last piece first. So the intuition is the voice of your soul. It is direct communication from your connection to God. And so it's a voice that you want to become acquainted with, right? 
intuition is going to, your soul's going to talk to you all the time, either in, in whispers or in symbolism or songs or writing or, you know, sometimes even someone that you don't expect will open their mouth and say something and you're like, oh, okay, I know where that's coming from. So that's what intuition is. I was not a person that I would say, you know, people say, oh, I was, I was, I could see spirit from the minute I was born, or, you know, I could hear spirit. I wasn't like that. I, I studied, I learned, and I developed my innate abilities. And I also cleared away the junk between me and my intuition, which was my fear voice, right? So direct, direct intuition means I don't use tarot. I don't use stones. I don't use crystals. What I do is I take a deep breath. I close my eyes and I move my consciousness into my heart and then up. And I ask my soul for information or my higher self for information. And I will either hear an answer or I'll get a picture or I'll get both or I'll just know. And I like that because I'm lazy. I never wanted to carry around decks of cards or, you know, carry around runes in a pouch or, or any of that kind of thing. Now, when I first started, a lot of people, and, and I did too, I used tarot and all that, but it was a much denser time back then. Right now, I mean, there, there are people your age, kids being born now, and, and they already connected. They don't have to, to, to pull out a card or, you know, anything. They're like, oh, yeah, they just know it. So the world has evolved. We, we have ascended, right? And we're not in that dense time anymore so that you don't need all that. You don't need years of training. You, you just really need to kind of sit and ask and listen. Thank you for sharing that. I, I totally agree with that. And you know, how can we know when our intuition is speaking to us? Because I think a lot of people struggle with that. I struggle with that sometimes, right? Where it might seem like my intuition is speaking with, to me and then all of a sudden I get hit with a with fear, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'm like, is this my intuition? Am I just afraid? You know, like how do I know that my intuition is, is speaking with me? Some people will say it's a gut feeling, like I feel it in my gut, other people will say they feel it in their chest. And I just want to know, like you've been doing this work for a long time. How do we know when our intuition is speaking to us? It's individual for everybody. Okay. There, there's a lot of commonalities, but you have to know yourself. So your fear voice, you want to be able to recognize your fear voice. Is that your mom trying to protect you? Is that... Um, a part of you that's afraid to move forward? Is it a part of you that's warning you and you should listen to it? So knowing yourself and, and knowing your own fear patterns is going to help a lot as far as that goes. Intuition is always loving. Intuition is never commanding or directive. Now your soul can be directive. Your soul may say, stop. And, and it might not say anything else, you know, um, your soul may say, go that way. But your intuition is going to be more of a whisper. Your intuition will say, think about that, you know, double check that. And we have to take a breath to stop and consider it. What happens with the intuition is we get it and then we kind of ignore it, you know, your intuition says, don't, don't drive to work that way today. And you're like, eh, you know, I drive to work today every day. It's not a problem. Then you get in the car and you're stuck in traffic and you know, oh, I should have listened to it. Right. So intuition is soft. It's loving. And how it affirms itself for you is, is very much an individual thing. I don't get the stomach stuff or anything like that. When I have a, a very important decision to make, I'll, I'll ask my intuition, I'll ask my intuition and I'll make a decision. And I know that I've made the right decision if it doesn't haunt me. 
when I haven't made the right decision for myself, I, it's in my mind all the time. I'm arguing with myself day and night. I can't sleep. You know, everything is disturbed. And then as soon as I make the right choice, I'm like, ah, oh, okay, everything's great. So for me, it's a relief. For someone else, it, it might feel they're, they're, you might have to pay attention to how your body feels when you're happy versus how your body feels when you're afraid. You have to know yourself. I think what you just said now is extremely important about when you make the decision and it's your intuition, you don't feel haunted by the decision, right? I've also heard people say, and I think this is true for myself as well, that sometimes I'm in the process of trying to figure out what to do. And sometimes it feels like go forward and other times like it's like not yet. There's this back and forth. And usually when I feel that way, it's a lot of like angst in my chest. And I realize that sometimes I need more information, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I know sometimes I expect my intuition to be instant. Like my intuition should know how to map out the, like it should kind of know from this like ethereal place what the future is going to be. And I should have an instant answer. But sometimes it's kind of like you need more information and the more information you get about certain things, your intuition becomes stronger. Cause I realize like there are certain things where my intuition is super strong about it's like, yes, no, move forward. Don't move forward. Do this. Don't do that. And then other times certain decisions are neutral. So I think the intuition piece is it, it, it becomes harder to unearth. I don't know if you agree with that. Like when it comes to like neutral decisions, sometimes I feel like, I can't fully decipher what my intuition is trying to say. And I'll stop there and let you kind of um, yeah. talk about that. No, I, and I agree with you because remember, we have free will. So your, your intuition is not there to eliminate free will. Your soul's not there to eliminate free will. So sometimes decisions are neutral. And most of the time, they're not good or bad. They're just going to take you down a different path. Now, one path might be less enjoyable than another, but from the soul perspective, you're going to end up learning what you need to learn anyway. So for us, if it's a, if it's a decision that is going to take you away from your purpose and your higher purpose, that's when you get haunted. So for me, it has, it's always been about family. For me, I, I, I came in and I wanted to have five boys. I wanted to have a big family, right? I, I wanted to, you know, be like a homesteader. Well, that's great, but that's not my spiritual purpose in this life. So every time I start to move towards, a, I'm going to put my spiritual work on the back burner and I'm going to put my, my family desires on the forefront, right? So that might look like maybe I'll go move in with one of my kids or maybe I'll, I'll babysit for my grandchildren, you know, every day. And when that happens, that's when I start to get haunted because I'm moving further and further away from balance. Yes, I can have family. Yes, I can have grandchildren, but I didn't come into this purpose, into this life to raise grandchildren. I know that. So when I'm, I'm, making the choice and drifting away from that. That's when I can't sleep. That's when I'm arguing with myself. That's when I'm doing the, yeah, but I really want to do this. And, da, 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 da. and why isn't it easy? And why isn't it falling into place? When it's something neutral, which usually occurs at work, actually, then my intuition gets very quiet. And then I know that it, I have to make my own decision. I have to decide. So there have been opportunities where I work where I could have I, I could have applied for promotion and sometimes I did. And when the opportunity came up, it was like, well, what do you want to do? You know, if you do the promotion, things will be different. Here's what will change. Do you want to do that? But I don't hear anything from my intuition saying, oh, yeah, you should go for that, you know, or oh, no, don't go for that. Then I know it's in the realm of free will. And when it happens, I know it's right for me. When it doesn't happen, I work through my disappointment 
And I find out later that it wasn't right for me. It's so fascinating how free will has entered the chat, entered the conversation. Because yes, I think that's true. I used to be so frustrated, like, why am I not hearing anything? And, you know, I would just, again, hear these whispers. I guess that was my intuition as well, where it's like, it's neutral. There's no right or wrong answer here. I think the 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 answers that feel more right or wrong when the intuition is speaking to you is are things that are more aligned with your soul purpose, which is something I want to talk about, right? I think things that are more aligned with your soul purpose and the reason you're here, at least whatever chapter you're in, because sometimes the pur- purposes change. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those tend to be louder, right? So can we talk about that a little bit more? I, I know you talk about soul purpose and aligning to that what exactly is a soul purpose and is that different from the regular purpose everyone seems to talk about yes I think it is um you know one of the things that that I've learned about I I spent a lot of years running to one intuitive to another asking them what my soul purpose was a soul purpose in my mind is different than a task so Soul purpose is not, is, it's not what everybody thinks it is. It is what you're here to learn or what, and what you're here to give, right? Mostly everybody on the planet right now is here to learn how to love themselves and to release fear and to share that with others. And so most of us are running around looking for a grand purpose, you know, is, is my purpose to be a great leader of a country? Is my purpose to be a great leader of an organization? Is my purpose to heal everybody on the planet? That's not it for 99% of us. 99% of us are here to learn to love ourselves and to love one another. And that's a big purpose right there. How we do that is where free will comes in. We have the free will to determine how we're gonna learn self-love. And some of us determine to learn that by being in poor relationships. Some of us learn to do that by loving others and then they teach us to love ourselves. Then I believe that some of us come in with a task and it is a task that is impressed upon us for this lifetime. And I know for me, what was impressed upon me is to be a teacher. So it doesn't matter what I do, where I go, who I'm in connection with, I'm a teacher. And and that's my task. Part of my task is to come in and help birth this ascension, the new shift, right? And I know that. And I know that the way that I do it is through teaching. I have friends that the way that they're here to support the ascension is by holding a higher frequency space wherever they go. So they're not doing their being, right? And so not everybody has a task and that's okay too. And if you don't have a task, that doesn't mean that you're, you're better or less or, or anything. It just means you need to focus on learning to love yourself and others and letting go of fear. Wow, okay, my mind is blown. Okay, just to make sure I fully understand. So soul purpose is kind of an overarching theme that as a collective, we all kind of share, right? Which you said is to love ourselves and to love others. Now, some of us have tasks, which I guess people would consider those tasks like in in the in regular conversations, people talk about purpose. So I guess the regular type of purpose that people are thinking about would be aligned to those tasks, correct? Um, So for example, maybe my task through shifting dimensions is to have these soul nourishing conversations that people can use and implement into their lives, right? That would be a task, but not necessarily a soul purpose. It could feed into my soul purpose with me kind of, this is my way of loving others in a way. Um, Mm -hmm. but it's not entirely tied to my sole purpose. Is that correct? Or is that oversimplified? Well, I think simple is good. Okay. And and I think it is correct. I mean, think about people have, I hate to use the word compulsion, but think about artists, right? They have a task. They're here to create art. 
Now, their sole purpose may still be to learn how to love themselves, right? And to, to uh, elevate their own esteem so that they're not starving artists. But people who have a task, it's like a, um, it's like, it's not a compulsion, that's a bad word, but it, it's something that you do wherever you go. Where, you know, wherever you, you are, that's who you are. And so you'll see that an artist, they're an artist no matter what they're doing, singing, painting, acting, writing, right? They're an artist, that's, that's their, their task. It's not always their purpose. Purpose is usually very personal. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And it's it's interesting that you don't want to use the word compulsion. And I understand it because sometimes when I try to explain, you know, somebody would ask me, what's driving you with this podcast? And it's I'm like, I don't want to sound crazy, but it's almost like an obsessive thought. I'm not manic, right? Yeah. It's not. And I get like, it's not compulsive in the way people would think about OCD, but it's just it's in every fiber of my being. And it's just this tap on my shoulder. Like you need to do it. You need to do it. And even when I'm in different spaces, like this part of me just comes out, I can't help it. So it's interesting that you broke that down because I've been trying to figure out the best way to describe what I was feeling in a way that people would fully understand it. And I think you just kind of gave some words to that, but I want to talk about this whole notion of self-love, right? Cause people talk about it all the time. I'm sure some people might be listening to it like, oh, really? Like our sole purpose is self-love. Like people talk about that all the time. Like what is so important about self-love, you know? And and what does it really mean to love the self? Because people might, you know, tie that into narcissism, but I don't mm -hmm. think it necessarily is. So how can you, how can we love ourselves? And why is that such a big part of our purpose? Oh, you know, I really empathize with, with your comment because a lot of the terminology that we use is very trite and it's easy to say it, but we need steps on how to do that. We need guidance, right? So just quick before I jump into that, I want to say that driven is an, ex an excellent word that you used. For years, I was accused of being driven. And my response was, well, if I wasn't driven, I wouldn't have accomplished what I had. So you be driven and you be okay with that. Um, as far as self-love goes, two things go into self-love. Self-love is about healing the self. I don't know a single person that I have ever encountered that did not come into this life with big lessons, big difficulties, right? If you look around the world now, just look at the people that you know big, all big stuff is happening, right? Not, not a little cold, a four week flu, you know, not, not a little upset in the family, but a big blow up. So we're here to heal that. And you heal it. And you heal yourself with love. You don't heal it by putting your foot in your back and pushing yourself over the line. You don't heal it by being angry or blaming, even if you want to blame yourself, that's not healing. If you look at any, any thing in the world today that is not right, it's because there's a lack of love. And so we have not been taught how to love ourselves. We've been taught how to give ourselves away to others and then they'll love us in return. And now we're learning that that's not really how it works because they, they can't love us in return because they don't know how to do it because they don't know how to love themselves either. So we're in this huge dysfunctional world that is crawling into higher frequency. And the glorious thing about higher frequency is that it accelerates energy. And when you accelerate energy, everything comes to the top, everything that needs to be healed. So all the good, right? Frequency is neutral. All the good and all the things that we say are in fear and not good. So when I talk about loving self, this has been a hard road for me. I've been my hardest critic. 
I still will catch myself saying, I wish I had never, if only I had. Well, that's not self-love, right? That's self-judgment. That is an ongoing process that, that we're all in the process of to one degree or another. So I like, I like small steps that accumulate and build on one another. So just the fact that I'm not judging myself for all of those past decisions is an act of self-love and it's an act of healing. It doesn't mean I didn't learn, doesn't mean I wasn't responsible, but it means that I've been able to forgive myself because I, I never have a problem forgiving others, right? So to me, that's how we start the process. And then we build on it. We surround ourselves with people who affirm our goodness rather than criticize and tear us down, right? Hold a space around yourself of forgiveness. Bring things into your environment that make you feel loved. You know, everyone in the world, everyone has had an experience of love. If not in this lifetime, then in another lifetime. And if you've had it once, you can recreate it. I learned that from hypnosis. So sit down, wrap yourself in a warm, fuzzy blanket, grab a stuffed animal or a pet and sit and hold that until you can feel some kind of comfort, whatever it is you associate with love and do that regularly. Change your dialogue about yourself instead of going, oh, I'm so stupid or, oh, I got that wrong again or, oh, you know, I didn't listen to my intuition again. I should know better change the way that you talk about yourself. It, it's, not, it's not an overnight kind of thing, but I don't think it was meant to be. Yes, I, I, I don't think it's overnight. And, you know, you, you talked about whenever you're elevating your frequency and you're getting closer to that point of self-love, all the things rise up to the surface. You know, every single time things rise up to the surface for me where there's a lot of negative self-talk I'm like oop I'm supposed to let this go I'm supposed to let this go if it's coming all the way to the surface if it's being triggered I'm supposed to let this go and I and I had an epiphany the other day when it comes to self-love I think there are two questions that always come up that tie into self-love right which is am I enough and am I worthy I think that is what everyone is constantly chasing because at the end of the day, we're human beings. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall short. And there are going to be moments where we don't feel worthy. We don't feel like we're enough because society tells us we need to have these accolades. We might have goals and ambitions for ourselves that we're, you know, struggling to meet. So it's just constantly trying to feel like I'm enough. I'm worthy, right? Doesn't mean I don't continue to work towards being the healthiest version of myself because I think sometimes people feel like if I'm not hard on myself if I don't criticize myself if I'm not real with myself quote unquote then I'm stuck in this space right like for example if someone doesn't have any goals for their life and and, and maybe they're couch surfing if they aren't hard on themselves they might think okay well I'm never going to put in the work to get a job and move forward right but I do think that there's a way to still have reverence for your being and still move forward and still be ambitious and, and get your life in order. So those two questions are questions that have popped into my head that I'm I'm actively in the process of working through because every single time I feel like I'm like, oh, I finally arrived at self-love. There's like another layer and there's another layer, right? Yeah. And it makes me think about this whole notion of us being in earth school and why we need to learn and evolve, right? Because sometimes I'm like, oh, what's the point of doing all of this? But even in this 3D world, right, when it comes to learning, like, yes, I can be in a space of peace and tranquility and be like, oh, nothing's wrong with me. I'm not being triggered. But I realized that there's still some little, little things in the shadows that I, I need to work through. And sometimes having certain experiences or putting ourselves in situations that are, are uncomfortable are going to wake up, are going to trigger us so that we can let go of the things that make us feel less than. And that was a lot there, but I just want to hear your thoughts yeah. on, you know, self-worth and being enough as it pertains to self-love. Well, I, I like your two questions. Um, 
they're different than my two questions, but I like yours. My two questions are about why. Why am I doing this? Why am I feeling this? So I tell everyone, ask yourself this question. Am I doing this because I love myself so much that I couldn't possibly do anything else? Or am I doing this because I'm afraid that something will or won't happen? And so I say, when you get up in the morning and you brush your teeth, you should ask yourself that question. Because a lot of our conditioning is to act out of fear. Well, if I don't brush my teeth, my, not, they're going to fall out of my head, right? Instead of, you know, I really love myself and I want to take care of my teeth because I'm going to have them for 120 years, right? So even just shifting that can make a big difference in how you approach yourself. When it comes to am I enough, we don't even know who we are. How do we know if we're enough if we're disconnected from our spirit? When you're connected to your spirit, you know you're enough because you're full, right? You're full of spirit. You're full of your higher self. We feel and ask that disconnected. And when we get connected, we don't have to ask the question anymore. We don't know our worth because we have been trained to believe that our worth is bestowed upon us by other people. And it's not false pride or false ego to know your worth. We've been told that that's what it is because you, in order to know your worth, you have to know the truth of yourself. And the truth of yourself is, is that you have light and dark within you. And, and to not know that means you don't know your worth. You don't know the totality of yourself. A lot of times we don't hear or we don't get our intuition because we really don't want to know the answer. You have to be willing to know what it is. Sometimes people ask a question and they're like, no, I don't really want to know. You know, because I want it to be a certain way and I don't want any information. You said information. I don't want any information that's going to contradict what I want. So people come to me all the time and say, can you tell me if this is the right person for me? And my answer is, you would know. And if you don't know anything that I tell you, you're going to rationalize. Right. Oh, I, I'm going to raise my hand there and say sometimes I ask questions like I want my intuition to tell me and I'm like, mm, do I really want to know? I don't know if I want to know the answer. Um. <laughs> you have to be ready to know because once you know, you have to act on it. Absolutely. And OK, so that's another thing, right, where in in terms of acting on our intuition, right? So I want to talk a little bit about intuition and manifestation and also intuition and healing I guess well you know what I want to start with intuition and healing first because we're on the topic of self-love and I think a lot of people struggle with forgiveness right forgiveness is a huge part of healing healing our our traumas healing so many you know emotional upheavals that we have how can we use our intuition to learn how to heal ourselves and most importantly forgive ourselves for moments where we not we were not our best versions and maybe we might have hurt other people oh that's a good question i would say to use the intuition to find out why i'm i'm a big wanting to know about motivation motivation and right motive means an awful lot to me So we're human, we make mistakes and we do things out of either our own damage or our own self-worth, right? If you want to put it in those kind of terms. When we do something out of damage, for example, let's say I, I want to protect my child from being hurt so I never let him out of the house. And then my child grows up and says, you kept me a prisoner in the house, right? And then I'm like, oh, I'm a terrible parent. And you go down that road of, of you know, self-recrimination and, and self-flagellation and all of that. 
but when you ask yourself why, ask your intuition, why did I do this? Why did I make that decision? Why do I feel the way I do? Why do I react the way I do? Your intuition's going to tell you the answer. And then the next question is, how do I bring that to balance within myself? You're always going to get an answer from your intuition if you're willing to ask the question and hear the response. And I would say follow what that response is. Now, the response may be to understand that, that you were also damaged and you were carrying forward a pattern that was given to you by people who loved you in the best way they can. The answer can be you need to make amends by admitting to your child that you're not a perfect parent. And that's really hard for people to do. You know, when your kid says you're a terrible parent, your first reaction is to go, no, no, no. You know, instead of saying, right, I was terrible. However, I was the best that I could be for you where I was at that time. I'm not there now. And I'm sorry. And I hope that you can forgive me and understand where that was coming from. And so that's how I think we start forgiveness for self is to ask the intuition those questions rather than what the psychologists say I should do, what the self-help people say I should do, what the expert says I should do. Nobody knows you like you do. Nobody knows you like your soul does. I would go there first. It's great to get other opinions, but you know as well as I do, and you think about the people in your life if you ask them a question, you already know what they're going to tell you. You already know what perspective they're coming from. And so a lot of times we ask the people who are going to support us in what we already want to hear rather than in what we should hear or what will help us heal and grow. Your, your intuition loves you. Your soul loves you. It, it's not going to berate you. It's going to give you the best advice possible. And so your path to forgiveness may be completely different than mine. You know, your path to forgiveness may mean to remove someone from your life. And so you can work on healing yourself. And mine may be to have that person in my life so that they're in my face all the time. It, it's, I hate to say everything's so individualized, but it really is. When we do that, that one size fits all, that's when we start to get into trouble because what works for me might not work for you. And then you're like, okay, I'm unforgivable. Or I can't do that. And that's why a good intuitive will get out of their own way and what they think should happen and give you clear information based on what they're receiving from your higher and their higher. And I've, I've seen both. You know, I've seen intuitives who are going through a divorce and, and they, you know, every person who came to them for a relationship was told you should leave that person. You have to leave them. And, and you, you know, I'm sitting there going, oh, okay, that doesn't sound like projection, right? So when your own intuition is working and you hear that, you ask yourself, okay, is that for me or is that for them? And you can feel it. You can feel when information's not right, right? I know you can. Yeah, that's such a good point that it's everything is so in, individual, right? Like sometimes people can speak to you and you'll get some sort of confirmation in your spirit that, oh my gosh, that aligns with my intuition. And other times it just doesn't feel right. That's why sometimes this blanket statement of cut this person off or set this boundary doesn't necessarily work for everyone. And that's not the right path for everyone. And, you know, when it comes to self-forgiveness, one thing that I've realized is that the more I forgive myself, the more I'm able to hold space for other people and compassion. And when I can forgive myself, I can forgive others because sometimes I look back at versions of myself and things that I did. And, you know, so your question is like, why? Why did I feel the need to do this? And when you sit with that question and the layers start to peel back, like, oh, I, I felt like I needed to do this because. I felt like I would be accepted by this group of people. I felt like I needed to do this because I needed to prove myself in this type of way. My ego was driving me or I was hurt. I was distrusting. 
And then when you realize like, oh, that was what was, you know, driving me, that was like a programming. And once you release that, it's not that you can say, well, oh, it wasn't my fault. It's kind of understanding where that comes from. And then when you see other people who are acting out in certain ways, I ask like, where did this start? You know what I mean? Like, obviously mm-hmm. I can't solve it and it's not my job to try to heal everyone and be like where did it come from and put myself in a line of fire where they kind of take out all of their trauma on me but I think once I start asking that question for myself like why where is this coming from I'm able to kind of ask the same question you know in in regards to other people in my mind like oh I wonder why they get so angry by that statement. I wonder why this is so triggering for them. I wonder why they feel like they needed to do that. So I think that's a a really great point that you made. Yeah, I love that you said the word compassion because when, when someone is doing a behavior that you have not forgiven yourself for, you're going to get angry at them. You're going to have a reaction to it. You're going to get triggered, as they say. But when you have healed that within yourself and forgiven yourself, it doesn't mean you allow them to continue to do that behavior with you, but you have compassion for where it's coming from. And you can hold a space that gives them the opportunity to be different. And then it's up to them to take that opportunity or not. But when you look at the world today, how lacking in in compassion is the world? We're, we're so divisive. There's hardly any compassion in, in the greater, you know, the larger world right now. It's either my way or the highway. And that speaks to the fact that we are not loving and we're, we're not forgiving. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There isn't a lot of compassion in the world we live in. And I love what you said that when someone's doing something that you have not forgiven yourself for, it's going to piss you off. And sometimes we don't even realize that the person we're so pissed at in some way, shape or another is is a mirror to the stuff that we need to release. It's so fascinating how we're all interconnected and how much our relationships are the driving force for our growth and evolution, especially romantic relationships and familial or family relationships. It's, it's very fascinating. It is. And yeah. it, it's a great opportunity because, <clears throat> you know, not everybody has to get married to, to grow. Not everybody has to have children to grow. Not everybody has to have a career to grow. There are multiple opportunities for us to grow and expand and shift if you just pay attention. You know, if you're willing to learn, everything's learning. Yes, everything's learning. And I and this question just popped into my head. So does self-forgiveness and self-love tie into karmic principles? Yeah. How? Well, when you when when you forgive others and self, I believe you activate the law of grace. And the, the law of grace releases that karmic connection. When, when you are, you are no longer desiring to create a balance or having to have a balance or, um, you know, that, that, that old eye for an eye thing, that, that's a lot of karma. Now, karma can be an absolute blessing, right? When you think of all of the wonderful things that you've learned, all of the great experiences you've had and all of the wisdom you've accumulated, well, that comes in too. And that's great karma. That's karma as well. But we tend to think of karma as the punishing, balancing, (laughs) you know, force of nature. And for some of us, you know, karma can be a a great incentive. After I separated from my first husband, uh, I saw an intuitive and he said, you know, you really need to learn to to forgive your mother-in-law. You're going to have to do this all over again. And I said, tell me what I have to do. I, I will do whatever you tell me because I am not doing this again. So it can be a motivator. I personally believe that if we learn to forgive ourselves and, and live in a place of grace and love, we won't need karma. Wow, what a, what a take because people will talk about karma so much and it's always kind of like this thing I think about where it's like, 
I don't want to be stuck in a karmic loop, right? Like I, I want to let go of those ties and all that stuff. And sometimes it feels like unless you take out a specific action, you might not release that karma. But the more I think about it, the more I'm like, well, if I've made peace with this, like like you said, the law of grace, forgiveness, then there's nothing to balance out, right? Because the karma is kind of like a, a dance of balance almost. Um, so I think it's fascinating that you brought that up. And I, and I think that kind of rings true for me intuitively, right? Because forgiveness and, and giving grace is like a release. You know, you, you're no longer taking things personal. Their actions no longer affect you. You're not living your life with some sort of chip on your shoulder because of what this person did to you. And it is, it is a journey getting there, especially when the person you have to forgive has hurt you immensely but it's a different level of transcendence when you're able to be totally unaffected by that person or that thing yeah so yeah, yeah. that is that is an action of its in it of itself um and listening to your intuition and and speaking of action I kind of want to go back go to the intuition manifestation and how they correlate with each other um so how how do they correlate with each other and how can we accept what we manifest? Because that's something that I struggle with as well, especially when you manifest something that seems too yeah. good to be true. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Intuition is a tool that we can use as we are creating. One of the things that I learned from my teacher, um, from teaching perceptive awareness all those years, is that intuition is the key to creativity. And creativity is what allows us to create, right? So when you activate your intuition, it's going to create inspiration. It's going to guide you into what's your highest and best, right? When it comes to manifestation. And your intuition is also going to help you get out of the way. Because we tend to get in the way of, of our creation, right? So manifesting with intuition is kind of like listening to intuition. If, if you walk around all day going, oh, I really want to have this. I really want to have this. I really want to have this. How am I going to create this? What am I going to do? You're, you're not in a, in a trusting, loving place, right? And you're cutting off your own creativity because you're, you're trying to figure out for yourself how to do this. And this has been a hard lesson for me. I'm a type A personality. I want to do it. So when I think to myself, well, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to create some videos. Now I have to learn this and I have to do this and I have to put this up. And, I have a, and then I forget about all my unseen help. And then it becomes a chore and I'm limited by what I can think of. But when I use my intuition, and I say, you know, I'd really like to do something like this. I would love to have the person who can help me do that placed on my path. I would love to have the tools that I'm going to need to create what it is that I want to create. And then I ask my intuition to inspire me. And the way that I do that is to daydream, just daydream instead of you know, when, when people say that they want to move, I say, well, don't picture the house that you want. Picture what you want to feel like when you go in the house. Picture where you'd like the neighborhood to be. Do you want to be closer to the city or do you want to be out, outdoors? Be flexible in, in what it is you want to create, but don't be so rigid that it's going to take the universe 20 years to create exactly what you're asking for. Whereas if you just say, you know, I, I'd really like to find the right place for me in a community of people that are going to support my dreams, you know, that, that support one another, um, you know, in a place that um, uh, is going to be beneficial for my work and in a place that will be safe and comfortable for me. Let's see what you come up with. And then daydream when you're in meditation, ask your intuition guide me to the right place, guide the right people to me. Then everything happens instantly. 
um, in my last video, I was talking about a friend of mine who was traveling and he was in another country and, and he wanted to, you know, really make some great contacts. So he was working on his stuff, you know, just kind of putting down roots, getting his energy in a place. And he said to me, I had the thought that, you know, I've been pretty isolated for the last couple of days. I'd really like to meet somebody who is a spiritual guide. He said, he said, a meetup popped up on his, on his phone and he thought, okay, I'll go check it out. He said, he met someone who was so in tune, so spiritual and said, you know what? I'm going to show you all around. And, and it was just like that, just a thought instead of, oh, I have to go search bulletin boards and simple, right? Simple. His intuition is what nudged him to go to the meetup. See, you see how it works? So the intuition kind of nudges us to take the right step in order to manifest what we want. Got it. So how can we accept the things that we manifest? Because I think that ties into self-love and self-worth as well, because there are certain things that I've manifested that just seemed like too good to be true, like the best case scenario. And of course, I'm like waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm like, it can't be just this perfect. How can we get to a point where we can genuinely accept our manifestations? Because I do think that ties into self-love and a, a lot of times people self-sabotage, unfortunately. It is. I know you've heard many times people are not afraid of failure. They're afraid of success because we know that success is going to change everything. We're comfortable. We might not like it, but we're comfortable with failure. We're comfortable with limits. We're comfortable with being less than. And when we're presented with great expansion, which is what's happening right now, actually on the planet, there's a part of us that says, oh my God, everything's gonna change. I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I want that. I don't know if I can do that. That's the fear, right? So I, I, I laugh because I have people tell me all the time, oh, I really, really want this. I'm like, okay, but not tomorrow. I want it at some point in the future, right? Some indistinguishable place somewhere in the future where it's not gonna affect me. Or they say, I want everything to change. But when it does, they're like, no, I thought everything would stay the same, but be different. Right. And so when people say, you know, let's say I want I want to make more money. I want to be more prosperous. I want to be able to support myself and my family better. And the next thing that happens is they lose their job. And, and then, then they're, you know, oh, that's not what I said. Well, you might have had to lose that job to get the better one to give you what you want. But as, as that starts to happen, everybody's like, no, 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 I don't want that. I think the answer to your question is trust. You have to trust your intuition. You have to trust your higher. You have to trust yourself to know that you're doing the right thing for yourself. And that goes back to everything that we talked about. Are you being honest with yourself? Is this really going to be good for you? Is this really something that you want? Um, you know, is it, is it the right time for it right now? You have to be willing to be honest with yourself and then say to yourself, okay, the only reason this isn't happening is because I'm afraid. Now, the next question for your intuition is, well, what do I need to do to get ready? What do I need to do to eliminate that fear so that I can wrap my arms around it and own it. That's what breaks the pattern. Great question. That's a great question. Something that's been popping up for me recently has been trust, but like self-trust, right? Being able to make decisions because I'm the type of person where I'll have a thought or I'll have an idea and I have to run it by everyone because I'm not sure if what I'm hearing is accurate like what if I miss something somebody else might you know point me in a direction or show me something that I can't see but I need to kind of learn how to 
continuing to make decisions by myself. Not that I can't seek counsel, but mm-hmm. the more I, I make decisions by myself, the more I can trust myself and build that muscle of trust. Cause you're right. I think trust is, is such a big deal and feeling worthy of like, yes, I, I do deserve this. And, you know, the, the more I, you know, work towards that and I'm getting a lot of manifestations and I I just really want to make sure that I don't block that flow. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think part of not blocking that flow is leaning into trust. Right. And sometimes I feel like a lot of decisions we make in life, most times we can change our minds. Right. That's another thing I'm also learning as well. I always feel like if I do this, I'm locked in. Right. And sometimes, you know, we need to go through a certain path so that we can learn to trust our intuition the next time it warns us not to do certain things. Right. Um, So that was a great, great question that you brought up. And you also talked about dreams, the idea of daydreaming and kind of talking to our intuition during uh, daydreams, but we also go to sleep and we dream. And something that you talk about is that our dreams give us symbols, you know, so that we can, that we can apply in our waking life. They kind of serve as some sort of intuitive guide. And, you know, you wrote a book on it called Mapping the Inner Landscape, Decoding the Symbols of Dreams in Everyday Life. So I want to start there. I do want to talk about dreams and, and how they work with our intuition and the symbols. Why was it important for you to write this book? Why do you think it's really important to focus on our dreams? Oh, my goodness. Two reasons. Um, the very first reason is that I taught this class for about 10 years. And, and I thought, well, why should I keep teaching it when I could just write it down in a book and then everybody will have it? <laughs> so, so that was the compelling reason behind it, um, was so that it could reach more people, more people would have the information. The other thing is that I've, I've always been a grand observer of my life. And I've always asked the question, why? What, what's beneath, what's underneath of what's happening, right? Because I can see patterns very easily, which is, of course, why I came up with soul patterning. It's easy for me to recognize patterns. So what I was taught was the way that, that the soul, the universe, converses with us is first through your home, then through your car, than through your body. And so it's not just dream symbols, but life event symbols. So for example, um, when you think about the heart of your home, I always think of, of the kitchen, right? So for me, it's the kitchen. For someone else, it might be a furnace, right? Or a, a heater, I don't know. But for me, it's the kitchen. So when things start going wrong in my kitchen, right? The stove's not working, the refrigerator's having issues. Like, okay, something's going on here in, in, in my home. Well, I could just say, well, let's go fix the, the washer. Let's go fix the, you know, the, the stove. And then we move on. And then a little while later, my car engine has problems. And now I have to take the car in because the gas gets blown and now the engine's no good. And now I have to go get another car. And then I can walk around and say, well, why is the car going? This, you know, this is a bad thing, this terrible time. Go get a new car and move on. And then somewhere down the road, all of a sudden, I've got high blood pressure. Now I've had three events in my life connected to the heart. And now that I have high blood pressure, I need to deal with it. Because it's in my body, I can't escape it and move on. It has to be dealt with. So I could work on the physical aspects, take the high blood pressure medication, change my diet, whatever. But I always want to know the emotional cause of something. And so I know that heart issues are related to heart ache. Betrayal, pain, right? So if I look at that, I can say, ah, okay, let let me focus on that. So I know that until I heal that heartache within myself, I'm going to have dreams about having a heart attack. I'm going to have things breaking down. I may have another car 
that, that goes right away, right? We may have more issues in the house. Um, I may be surrounded by people who are experiencing heartache. So I, I tend to look at those things. I'll tell you an example real quick that'll make you laugh. When I was married to my second husband, we, we was, he was carpenter and we were not getting along. The relationship was not good. And I did not want to know about that. I, I wanted everything to be the way it was. Well, he went out and picked up some wood, put it in the car and stopped short and the wood shifted and cracked the windshield. And so that was my car he was driving, not his. So we had to go get the windshield replaced. Okay, so we got the windshield replaced. My youngest daughter gets in the car, she rolls down the window and the handle comes off. Of the Because the, back then they were manual, right? The handle comes off, now the window won't go up and down. So ended up getting another car. The next car I got, Car ran great. Everything was great. My daughter gets in the car, pulls the handle off of the window again on the driver's side, driving along. Chip comes up, cracks the window, and it goes right across my line of vision. At that point, I said, okay, I'm not doing anything until I figure it out what it is I'm not willing to see. And, and I, was, I was in a panic at that point. And then and then I, I discovered what it was. And then I had to deal with it. Do you mind sharing what it was? Or it, if it's too personal, you don't have to. No, it's, it's fine. My husband was, um, at the time, he was alcohol and drug addicted. And, and he was spending money um, and giving me reasons for why our finances were dwindling. And I didn't look, I didn't pay attention to my, my antenna was wiggling. And I just accepted what he said because I was not willing to face the fact that once I knew this thing, the marriage was over. And I wasn't ready for it to be over. I didn't want to see it. Wow. And the car was symbolizing that there was something off in your, in your household and you just weren't paying attention to it. I didn't want to see it. Everything came right across my vision, right? everything about glass and windows and mm. all of that. So to me, I'm a person who says, well, I don't want to wait for it to come into my body. I want to catch it. You know, if you think about it, the, the house is your soul whispering. The car is your soul talking. Your body is your being yelled at. And so when you look at symbols you can look at them and what is what does that thing do? What is its function, right? So what does a windshield do? What, what does a radiator do, right? Radiators regulate temperature. So there's an anger there, right? When the coffee pot goes, there's anger there. When the, the hot water heater goes, there's anger there, right? Um, so I always found it very fascinating um, if you look in the book, there's a whole chapter on car accidents. I'll tell you what, when someone has a car accident, I'm the first person to go, where'd they hit you? What were you doing? You know, whose car was it? Because I can tell everything about a person's life based on what happened in that accident. And I don't have to be psychic to do that. Wow. So can you interpret so you, you talked about stuff that happens in the waking world, like the symbols, like the signs that you get, right? And I think for me, I get my patterns for like, hey, you need to look at something definitely very somatic within the body. And I also see it in the dream as well, right? Like there was a time where um, I would have so many dreams about my parents getting hurt, but I kind of felt like it was less about them getting hurt in this like random fear and guilt that I had about maybe not being home, maybe not seeing them as much. So it was manifesting. It was showing me that I was worried about something. I needed to release that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so there, there's so many rabbit holes I can go down, but like my dreams definitely show me things that are, are bothering me that I need to look at that I need to release. Right. So when it, when it comes to the dream world, are you able to interpret people's dreams? Yeah. Um, because when I, when I interpret a dream, I use my intuition to interpret what those symbols mean for you rather than what they mean for me. 
And so I love dream interpretation. It, it's probably the way that I started exercising my intuition um, when I was just a child. And, and so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that I love to do. So if you have one that you would like me to look at, I'd be happy to look at it for you. Oh my God. That's so exciting. Oh gosh. There's been so many dreams that I've had recently. Okay. I actually have a dream diary that could I actually wrote down a couple of dreams. So I could bring that up actually. Good girl. I love that. Yeah. Now, while you're looking, do you go back through your dream diary and read them? Because they'll tell you a story. You know, I haven't gone back in a while. I was recording them from, I started recording them. I, I d recorded them sporadically throughout the year. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I haven't gone back to read them just yet. I was going to do that towards the end of the, um, I was going to do that towards the end of the year. Um, yeah. So I had two, um, I had two distinct dreams one time, at, at least at the beginning of the year. I'll, I'll, I'll use this one. So there was a, a dream that I had where I, um, it happened twice, like the new year of 2023 and also the new year of 2024. It was this person that appeared in my dream that, I had had some sort of <clears throat> crush on, right? Mm -hmm. But they kind of appeared in my dream in a way where they were hesitant about the connection. We've never like had an actual romantic connection, but I thought it was weird because they popped into my dream twice at the beginning of the new year, right? Where it was like, it seemed like there could be a romantic connection, but they were adamant about potentially blocking that. So that's kind of one of the dreams that I've I've had that I was always curious as to like, what exactly does that mean? Okay. Well, I would say that having the dream at the new year is a symbol for new beginnings, right? New opportunities, new beginnings. The person that, that you're talking about represents potential, unfulfilled potential. So there's a part of you that really longs for a deep, loving, romantic relationship and can see potential, but hasn't been able to realize that potential. And so at the beginning of the year, you're like, maybe this is the year, right? Maybe this is, it'll happen. And this person perfectly represents uh, a, an unfulfilled opportunity. Now, I don't think the person's hesitant. I think you are. <clears throat> so while we may feel that people out there are hesitant to commit to us or people out there are, are not ready for who we are, or the universe hasn't placed the person in my path that, that is ready for me, right? Or can fulfill this, this promise for me. I would turn it around and I would say, why am I not ready? Why have I not created the opportunity for myself? What am I holding back? Why do I feel that, that I'm not in a position to, to delve into something absolutely wonderful. So it may be that you might want to ask yourself questions as to what are my expectations of myself? What are my beliefs about this? Am I going to be in a power struggle? Um, have in the past, I had the experience of giving all of my power away to the relationship putting myself on the back burner, um, you know, investing more into the other person's needs than accepting what I needed. Am I going to lose myself? Um, look at past relationships. Look at, can I balance this? Um, you know, can I balance this aspect of my life with the aspect of my life that, that is going really well right now? Um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of people believe that if I get into a relationship, it means 
for a woman. Now I, now I have to cook and clean for somebody else. Um, or now I have to take care of someone else. Um, for a, a man, it can be, you know, if I get into a relationship, there goes all of my income um, or there goes all of my me time. And so you want to look at any kind of beliefs that you have um, about that. You know, I had a friend say to me once, why do you want to get married again? All you're going to do is end up cooking and cleaning for another person. And I said, well, the person I marry is either going to be a great cook or he's going to like to eat out all the time. So we, we want to shift those, those beliefs. I would say for you, don't wait for a new beginning. Don't wait for you to, to believe that, that you're new or this is a new chance for you really honestly look at yourself and totally accept who you are and know that someone else is going to totally accept who you are and know that you're not the same person that you were in the past. There won't be power struggles. You won't have to give up. You'll be sharing and it'll be a sharing experience rather than a tug of war of two needy people. Oh my God, you literally just <laughs> read my whole life. Oh my, you know, it's so interesting. Everything you're saying, I've come to an awareness of in the last week, right? And it's not even about the person, you know, I, I think like you said, it's, it's, it's more of a symbolic thing than, mm -hmm. oh, this is the person that's popped up into my dream because it's not even someone that I, I think about now or consider or you know any of that stuff but I just found it fascinating that those that was the same dream I had at the beginning of you know the year twice which I was like what is what does this mean and everything you said totally aligns with how I feel intuitively but I I never would have thought to interpret that dream that way and the fact that you were able to do that is amazing that is I'm just I'm mind blown. So I'm at a loss for words. So thank you so much for doing that. And it's interesting because, you know, when you go online, like the first thing I do after I have a dream, I go online, like, what does this mean? And it seems like it's more of dream interpretation. I think sometimes looking those things up online could be helpful, but a lot of times we probably have to sit with it, right? Mm -hmm. It's more of like, it's personal to us, us and Google might not really be able to have the answers for us. Well, that's the other reason I wrote the book is because I used to do that. I used mm. to buy dream books. I used to go look it up and I, I would look at it and go, that's not me. That, that mm. doesn't fit for me, you know? So, so when we're done, you give me your address. I'll send you my book. Okay. Um, because it'll, it'll guide you on how to make your own dream book, how to make your own symbols. Um, and what they mean for you. you know, I always say, you know, someone's Lake Placid is my drowning. You know, when, mm. when I started using learning meditation, somebody, everyone would say, oh, picture yourself in a boat on a lake and, and there's, it's very still. And all I could think about was, well, I can't swim. And, and they were like, this is not relaxing. So what's a relaxing symbol for someone is, is terror for someone else. So I was like, I have to figure it out for myself. The other thing is when, when you're working as a healer and an intuitive and you want to know why somebody has a broken arm, I can't take my hands off and go, let me go look at my dream book. You know, I have to ask. I ask my intuition, what happened? Why is their arm broken? And then I get what I get. Now, for some people, it's because they're afraid to grasp the future. For some people, it's they're so angry that they pulled a punch and broke their arm. So it's really individual. Wow. Getting so, that theme. <laughs> yeah, it's really individual. And so when you were doing the dream interpretation, were you connecting to my higher self or were you connecting to my own intuition? I, I don't know if that's a weird question. It's not a weird question. So when I, when I tune in, I go to my higher who is in contact with yours, right? Because we are connected in that way. And so I, I ask my intuition and my higher gives me the information, but where does my higher get it from? They get it from yours. Okay. That makes sense. And just one more question tied to the reading that you just did, which again, I'm just 
I can't wait to go back and listen to it fully and fully, you know, immerse myself in it. But when you talked about don't wait for new beginnings, it's kind of basically taking action to unlearn things that are holding me back. Give yourself permission. You don't have to be perfect to bring Mm. something into your life. You can bring something into your life right where you are and evolve Mm. and it won't be a disaster. You're waiting until you feel like you've gotten to a certain point yeah, and then you'll be ready. And so for many of us, it's, I'm not going to do that until I know I won't get duped again or tricked again, or I'm not going to do that until I'm absolutely sure I can trust again. What I want you to recognize is that the person that's talking to me right now is not the person who was in those other relationships. She's grown, she's changed, she's different. And by knowing that you're different, you automatically know that you can't repeat the past because you're not that person. If you hadn't changed and you hadn't grown and you hadn't learned anything, yeah, you're gonna repeat the past. That, that's unavoidable, right? So my business, we call it same crap, different body. If you don't change, you're gonna bring the same person in no matter how different they look. If you shift yourself, you can't bring in the same thing. You mm. gotta trust yourself. Oh man, this is this is so timely. It's it's interesting. Like whenever I come into some come across someone who gives me a reading, I would have had some sort of epiphany that is similar to the themes that come up in that reading, which again, trust, acceptance of self, knowing that I've changed, knowing that I'm not going to repeat the past, knowing that I don't have to be perfect or reach a certain level to be worthy of what I'm desiring or calling in. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for that. That was a blessing. Thank you for, 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 for doing that. Um, and you know, I, you mentioned it before you talked about soul patterns, I guess, soul patterns kind of, do they go hand in hand with the messages we receive in our lives that kind of are pushing us towards our, our higher consciousness, our higher selves? Yeah. Soul patterning's evolved a lot since I first brought it through. Um, really, really shifted. Um, yes, it is a it, it is a healing uh, path to your soul, to your akashic record, to what's written in your book of life. Um, it is a way for us in this time period to activate innate gifts that we have. Um, from other experiences, other lifetimes. It is a way for us to heal things within ourself in a way that does not necessarily require years of work. We, we don't have time. And, and I don't have the patience, honestly. Um, uh, you know, if you're doing that for years and years and years, I want fast and I want it to be effective. And that's what this is for. This is a way for us to to elevate our frequency so that we can keep up with the shifting energies that are happening right now. And our bodies are really struggling to, to keep up, you know, so are our emotions. Um, and that's really what it's for. So, so what is this great shift? I always ask people this because people talk about we're, we're shifting into the 5D. There's so much happening. Um, people are talking about fine-tuning their energy, raising their energy. So so what is the shift and, and why is it important for us to lift our energy in order to, to match that so we can be balanced through the shift? It is, first of all, we're not going anywhere. The shift is internal. It's a shift from fear to love. It's a shift from fear to love. It's a shift from lower energy to higher energy. It's a shift from separation to oneness. It is a resolving of the the duality that we've been struggling under. So when you look at history, I mean, go back hundreds of thousands of years, we have lived in in a world, in an experience, whether it's this lifetime or thousands of other lifetimes, where we're in a place of fear. 
we've been taught fear we've we have it embedded in ourselves and humanity and the planet is kind of over it and so the frequencies that are coming in that are pouring into us right now from the soul from the galaxy from our galactic families from our soul families from the angels from our guardians from god all of the frequencies coming into the planet are designed to help us lift ourselves out of fear into love and to the shift from third dimension which is very dense very heavy very plotting very you know negative very dualistic right right and wrong um i'm good you're bad right all of that is shifting away from those paradigms into one of love and acceptance and acceptance doesn't mean i'm going to bludgeon you until you accept my way <laughs> right it, it means that i love and accept myself and the planet is done the the planet the the being that is our planet you know your 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 mind is not in your brain the planet gaia is not in the in the the, the globe right that being is tired of this and is evolving the shift is evolution and we elevate by lifting our consciousness and we lift our consciousness by changing our frequency. And it's always going to come back to frequency. Well said. And I guess that ties into what you called earth grid healing. Okay. So earth grid healing is allowing the earth, the crystalline grid of this earth, the pure grid of this earth to heal us. Mm. And for us to come into alignment with it, yeah. you see, we're not going to heal the earth. The, the earth doesn't need us to heal it. The earth needs us to get out of the way yeah. <laughs> so it can heal itself, right? Yeah. But if we come into harmony with, or that grid, then we can become partners in co-creating the shift, yeah. the evolution, right? So 5D is not a place. Nobody's going to another place. <laughs> I hate to break people's hearts. You know, no, nobody gets away. Yeah. The change has to be internal. It has mm. to be inside. And then everything else shifts. Right. So we're shifting to higher frequencies. It's it's more of like with, within the mind, within the consciousness. It's not really a physical place per se. Um, but that shift is going to have profound effects on, on the world that we live in currently. Um, people talk about heaven on earth and all of that stuff. So it's it's such a beautiful um symbol of hope and I definitely feel that and and that is part of my purpose for this podcast um uh, has hence shifting dimensions moving from a place from a, a fear to more love so I think that's a, a great way to come full circle on our conversation this was such an amazing amazing conversation I have to ask you if you've shifted in perspective on anything recently Yes, actually, I have. Um, just recently, I have shifted my perspective from being a fixer to being an allower. And because I've been, and I am intuitive, I can look at a situation and I can tell you how to fix it. And if I really love you and I really care about you, I want to fix it for you. And I have come to the, the shift within myself in the last two or three months that I need to let that go and allow others to fix their own lives because otherwise they can't own it and they'll lose their power. And I don't want to take anybody's power. I resonate with that so much. You have no idea. I, I recently came into that shift myself this year. Um, so kudos to you for coming to that shift. Thank you for sharing that. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about you, if they want to take one of your workshops or just, you know, and, you know, dig deeper into your work and your book? Sure. Um, it's easy. My website is susanzumo.com. My email is susanzumo at gmail. 
um, which is very easy. Of course, you know about the YouTube channel. Um, they can look at me on the YouTube channel. It's messages from the Galactics. I think I'm at uh, letter N, S-O-U-L-D, number one, in sold one. Um, and that's how you can find me on YouTube. So yeah, I would, I would love to hear from everybody. I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing. And this is one of the, the most enjoyable conversations I've had. And I just appreciate getting all the information out there for everybody and the work you're doing on yourself. I think it's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. Again, I love having you as a guest. And I definitely see you coming back on the show. You know, once I dig deeper into your book, I, I'm sure so many people have questions about dream interpretations and we can go deeper on that. Um, but I'll be leaving all the links that you mentioned in the show notes. So thank you again for thank stopping you. by Shifting Dimensions.